We're talking sharp men with sandpaper. Love it when we're live. I'm Chris, and I'm in the studio. Uh, we're going to talk about blades. And what you'll notice is that it's in the on position, but the tip is not hot. Okay, so I'm not going to burn myself. Just like that, this is called jogging. This is my kind of jog. I'm not into that uh, heavy physical fitness stuff, so this works out good for me. Um, today we're going to be talking about chucks and the cold jaws would be for taking and holding the bulb this way. We always recommend leaving at least a 16th inch gap. It actually moves up and down and side to side uh, that are great if you're just looking to get something small to do some little tinkering with. Good afternoon and welcome to Abrasive and Proud of It Live. This is Mr. Chris Wood, and we are talking sandpaper sharpening today. That's right, Mike. As woodworkers, we all have tools, and sadly, they all need to be sharpened. Well, you know, if you, if you don't have the setup to, with a grinder or, you know, the high-end Tormek, some of the stuff that, like, Chris has been talking about the past couple of weeks, well, a lot of people are migrating over to diamond stones and water stones, oil stones, things like that, stuff that's been around a long time. And that's all fine. That's all works extremely well. But being that we're an abrasives company and most of our abrasives are designed for metal applications, but they're also used in wood, we formulated this really awesome sandpaper sharpening kit. Now, the benefit of sand sharpening with sandpaper is, well, we'll, we'll cover more of this later, was well, one, it's, it's an economical way to get into sharpening, uh, especially if you look at all the different accessories and jigs that you can buy to go along with it. Uh, you don't have to buy any crazy tools or, or machinery to do it. It can all be done by hand or using a series of jigs to get it done. So that's what we're going to look at today. We're going to look at our sandpaper sharpening kit, as well as a lot of the accessories. And then at the end, we're going to talk about some of the troubleshooting things that you might run into, like, you know, with, if the glue on the back of the material sticks or different ways that you can uh, perform the action. So let's take a look at that and see what we're going to get into. First, obviously, it's real easy to get, dive in and be tempted by, you know, a diamond kit. I personally have one. I use it. Uh, but at the same time, there are times where sandpaper sharpening is, one, it's cheaper. Two, it's, uh, it, it's sometimes more user-friendly. Um, if you've priced the, the, side, the price of these stones lately, diamond is not cheap. Um, sandpaper is relatively inexpensive, uh, consider. So we're going to look at a few things and kind of see if we can't talk about some of the kit. The first part that's going to come in the kit is this phenolic block. Um, you don't have to buy the kit with the phenolic block. We've, we sell this two ways. You can buy the sheets only or you can buy the kit with the phenolic block and the sheets. The same sheets come in this in the kit, both with the block and without, which is nice. And essentially what you're going to get with the sheet kit, you'll get 80, 120, 320, 600, and 1200. So you get all of these grits, which is extremely helpful. And the nice thing about that is you get three of each. They already come pre-cut six, six inches by 12 inches, so that makes it nice. Uh, easy to manipulate. You can use the entire sheet or you can do like I've done here and sort of piecemeal your block. And the way I've got this set up is I've got three grits on one side, which makes it easy for me to be able to go in there and do each of my grits in sequence and then move on and get back to work. And if I don't need the coarser two grits, I can really just mainly focus on my find, which makes that easy for me to replace as I need to. So if we're looking at these kits, um, with the block or without, uh, you're getting uh, aluminum oxide in your 80 and 120. And the, some of the benefits of aluminum oxide uh, are it's a tougher, harder grain, uh, or tough, hard grain, very durable, holds up well to metal. And you can see by that graphic, the way it wears is that it starts out sharp, but it becomes a blunt, more blunt as it's worn in. Uh, that doesn't mean it changes grits. It just means that it's not sanding as well as it once was. 
and that dulls down to a to a blunt tip. Whereas silicon carbide, on the other hand, um, it's a it's a very sharp grain. It's a it, actually it's the hardest grain apart from diamond. And the nice thing about that is it's it does a it goes through a process called friability, meaning as you use it, it fractures off, exposing new fresh grain. The nice thing is you're always left with a very sharp edge to be able to continue on your process until you get to the backing of your material. So we've included all of these in this kit. So it gets you through the range. The aluminum oxide, obviously, you would use for your more aggressive range, uh, shaping, uh, really getting uh, the, your, your chisel or your tool angled into whatever uh, angle you want it to use. If you're using a jig for repeatability purposes, it allows you to really get that tool shaped in for that, for that angle that you're using. That way, next time you go to it, you'll already have it. You won't have to really do a lot of maneuvering. That's why you probably won't use much of the aluminum oxide once you get your tool sh shaped. At that point, you're going to be back to, you know, the 1200, maybe to the honing pad, the honing, uh, the leather strump. Um, so so that'll allow you to, to really just keep your tool honed at that point and without, without a lot of sharpening required. That's the nice thing about sandpaper is because you have a huge range of grits available, unlike typically with water stones, oil stones, or diamond, usually you get very specific grit and there's a huge jump to the next grit. So for instance, you know, if you're looking at diamond, it might have a, it might start at 320, but then it goes to a thousand. Well, that's a, that's a pretty steep jump. And sometimes you need that sort of in between stage to get something fixed or to, to clean something up. That's the nice thing about sandpaper is it's, it's all these grits are available from literally 24 all the way up to 2000. Uh, and then once you get to that, that range, obviously you're switching to something to hone with, but that's the beauty of sandpaper, the versatility, the variety, just, just, there's no lack of options or grits available to do whatever you need to do. Now, if you buy the kit, it, maybe you don't want to buy the kit because you don't want these little pieces of, of abrasive. Now, some people would put an entire strip on here. I've chosen to do a little three inch piece. So I'm getting three and I, I don't sharpen by hand. I, I, I'll be, I just, I'm not good at it. I can't keep my angle. So I use a jig. Well, the reason these spaces are here is this allows my jig to ride in these empty spaces and maintain the right plane that it needs to without doing damage to my roller. That's the other thing. If you're, if you're on a, a diamond, um, there's no way around it. You have to uh, roll your wheel on the stone or the, or the plate. And what happens is that it starts to get scuffed up. So this minimizes any damage to my jig by having it on this phenolic plate. Now you could use uh, granite, you can use glass, um, any kind of, um, plate that you know is not going to warp or twist or have any bows or deflections. It needs to be flat. So we like the phenolic. It does very well. Uh, if I had to go somewhere else, it would be maybe with glass or granite. So there's a lot of options with this. If you wanted to make your own setup and you didn't want to buy the sheets, we offer all of these in rolls. Um, you can buy a six inch wide roll and it's five meters long. Normally we do 10 and 25 and 50 meter long rolls. But what we've done for sharpening is we've cut these down. So that way you can buy a partial roll, five meters long and whatever grit you want, um, and then go from there. That's why we made these sheets. For an entry level option, the sheets are essentially a good way to get into it to just see how you like sandpaper sharpening because sometimes you're just not sure how something's gonna take. Some people prefer going to a machine. Uh, there are some people who do really well sharpening things by hand. Me personally, I like the machine, but the problem with the machines is it's gonna put that convex shape on or that concave shape on your tool and if you don't want that if you want that perfectly flat angle then a stone or sandpaper is going to be your only option to do that so again we've got all the sandpaper you need let's talk about some of the accessories that might be available um, obviously leather straps we've got a variety of these this is just one we sell that's plain it's got a coarse side and a smooth side uh, so you could use either one of those for your final honing process we have a, a few, huge array of different honing compounds that can be applied to the leather. Uh, this just happens to be our Yellowstone. We sell a, a full range of those. You can go to our website and check those out. And depending on what you want to do, different compounds are going to get different results. Uh, we have some that are in block form like this. We've also got some that are in paste. Um, whatever is really up to you, there are some slight variations in what each of them are going to do. 
Uh, but it, it's kind of up to you and what your goal is uh, with your tool and what level of hone or sharpen, sharpness you're after. So we've got the leather straps. Now let's talk about some of the jig options. Um, there are some more economical options and there are some definitely some more heavier price point options. And then there's the much more advanced options. Now, obviously you're gonna want one of these because this is a little angle checker. Uh, if you're not sure what angle your tool is set at, how this works is if you see there, there are some angles etched into the surface of that little tool. And I happen to think that this is 25. So I'm gonna scroll around here and I'm gonna find the 25 and lock that in. And as you can see, that is pretty on the money. And so looking at it that way, that's that way you know that if you're gonna use a jig, you'd wanna set your jig up for right at that 25. And how you know is if I go to 30, there's, there's too much slop in there and that's you can see a gap in that. If I went down to 20, then it's too tight. It's not fitting just right. So I know that these, this chisel is set at 25 degrees, which makes things nice. So having this is helpful because most of your tools are going to be set at different angles. And knowing what that is, that'll help you at least get a head start for your jig. Now let's take a look at sort of the two entry level options. And what you see here, it's easy to notice the difference uh, between the two. Uh, you can see that this one has a much wider brass wheel than this one. This is uh, crucial, especially if you're worried about balance. Um, if you get into smaller chisels, this really plays a role because you don't want to start teeter-tottering on the wheel. Uh, that can create um, undesirable angles on your tools. So what this allows you to do is you're going to run your tool through both of these and either one you choose. But I like the wider wheel. It does give you more support because it's all about that base. And so when you choose the right one, both of them sort of work the same way. This one um, closes in and out this way. This one actually screws down and tightens onto the back of the tool, keeping everything flat, which is even better because uh, if your tool isn't sitting in here flat, then you're crooked right out of the gate. This ensures that that tool is flat against that plate, so it's not gonna move uh, while you're running your project. So a step up above that then would be the Veritas uh, honing guide. Now this is the, the deluxe set here that comes with the sort of angle setter jig. Um, this is a, a crucial add-on that comes with this tool. And I love the fact that the way they've designed this, it's got your pre-described angles kind of already on the plate. And as you can see, there's a series of them in green, yellow, and red. Um, the yellow is your standard angle. So in this case, I've got, already got my jig set up for 25 degrees. And so now when we set this up later, you'll be able to understand why that's crucial to know what that angle is, because then it helps you if you're going to set up a jig like this, then you don't have to worry about repeat, uh, not being able to repeat that same angle next time you set it up. So the other nice thing about this, this one over the more introductory levels options is you've got your different settings here for the plate that correspond to the angle checker. It's got a much wider surface here to lock down on your uh, tool. It's got a much wider brass wheel uh, for more stability and keeping everything together. And it's got a built-in feature right here. You can probably see this little notch here is angled up. Now, if I pull that out and rotate it, you can see that can rotate to six o'clock. Now what this is, this is a fine tune adjustment. So after you've gotten your chisel flat or your tool flat, what this allows you to do is rotate that. And this, this wheel is actually on a cam type angle. So what it'll do is it puts just a very fine angle on the end uh, for your tool, which is ideal for most of your flat chisel sharpening. So this is the, the Veritas honing guide system. I'm a huge fan. As a matter of fact, this one is mine. Um, it's very easy to use. And that's what I like because, uh, like I said, I'm not good at sharpening by hand, so I needed that extra ability because the key with sharpening is if you can't keep this on the keep keep this angle flat and you you keep rocking the chisel, you're you're going to have more of a more of a belly on there. So the key is you want to keep that flat as you're making that motion. So um, let's take a look at some of the other accessories that are available. So let's say you bought the plate with the sandpaper kit. You can use something as simple as door bumpers to go on the bottom. 
to keep it from moving around. You can use a router pad, which obviously we sell those too, or we've got these little rubber feet that are designed to go on the bottom of say, um, cutting boards uh, to keep it in place. Now, what I've done with that with mine, or ours rather, is I've just stuck two pieces of sandpaper on the bottom on either end, and that essentially keeps it in place uh, wherever I need it. Uh, the router pad is also helpful, but that's just one quick, easy way. I mean, we're already doing sandpaper. You may as well use sandpaper to hold it in place. Now, here's some of the pitfalls with using some of the sandpaper as your, um, as your, your surface is if you leave it on too long or it's overheated, you can see this is, this is quite gummy. Um, this is the result of uh, this abrasive on here. How long, Mike, would you say this has been on here? Uh, I years? would say that's been five years. Five years. So five years of PSA adhesive stuck on a surface, it's going to be gummy. And if you take it off and you get nothing but glue left, hey, you've won. Uh, most of the time, because this is a paper product, especially on the thinner uh, materials, what's going to happen is you're going to get left with this garb here that's almost impossible to get off. Now, there's ways around it. Um, you can use solvents like mineral spirits, acetone. Uh, they do work well. Uh, I don't like having that jostling around over my top, but, but it is what it is. If you're at this stage, that's really all you've got is some kind of a solvent. Uh, you can also use a heat gun to heat this back up and scrape it. Uh, but no matter what, you're still going to have to use some kind of solvent to do, to do some general cleaning. Now, let's take a look at the backside because I want to show you one quick way how that heat gun method would work. So I'm going to go ahead and lock this in. And so the camera doesn't be, keep moving around on me. Now, obviously, if you're going to use a heat gun, you're going to want to use proper safety tools. So obviously, I'm not going to be using gloves for this. Um, yeah, but normally you'd want to use, use proper safety tools and be very cautious. Heat guns can get very hot, and you certainly don't want to touch the tip of the gun while you're running. So let's take a look at kind of how that would work. You want to just move slowly across the surface and heat up an area. And this has a cone-shaped uh, hood on it. It generally won't take much. Let's kind of see what we've got. That needs a little more. It is a process, but if you don't let it stay on here five years, you typically should be okay. Yeah, see, here we go. And you just want to move across the surface, and you can see that, that glue is gumming up. That's what you're after. You want to get that, that glue nice and warm so it's more apt to come up cleanly. And don't get in a hurry. Let the, let the heat gun do its job. If you try to get in a hurry, you're going to be left with the garb on the other side. And I'll take a little bit of glue to clean up over all that paper that's over there. And there you go. Came off clean. Let me sit this on the concrete so it doesn't burn anything. Now, as you can see, that came off very clean and worked you know, left a lot of this, left some residue on there, but that's easily cleaned with a little bit of mineral spirits or acetone. And just for the sake of showing you, just so you, you understand that this does work. Now, again, you might want to wear gloves with this, and I probably should be. But a little bit of acetone kind of rubbed on there. You can also agitate that slightly with... Uh, you know, with a with a, a a wire brush, a brass brush, something like that. You get most of that off. You can see. Come back, hit that a little more. Now, clean as a whistle. So now we could reapply our um, abrasive here and get our plate set up. So let me empty this, get this off the table real quick, and we'll we'll walk through the process. Now, another thing that also works is a scraper. Um, once you get that glue warmed up, a scraper does a pretty good job at, at sort of scraping that up. This happens to be one that came with my little cheap heat gun. So let's take this out of the way. Now, I will tell you what I've done is I've got this set up with my coarser grits. And 
I have pre sort of flattened my chisel, to, sort of. I left some of it there so you could see that even on a new chisel, uh, you may have to do some flattening. So what you want to always do is you want to flatten the backside first to get, at, you don't have to do the whole length of the chisel. The main thing you got to focus on is here because when you go to sharpen this angle, if your back isn't flat, then you're going to get little dips in the, in the sharp edge point of your chisel. So you want to make sure this is flat. So we're going to hit this real quick. And ideally what you want to do is you want to make sure you're keeping pressure here. Let me make sure this is locked in place so it doesn't go anywhere on me. You want to keep pressure down here. Let's see if I can't shift this. Sorry about that. There we go. You want to keep pressure there. You don't want to put much pressure out here at all or you're going to get this, this action. So ideally, if you want to keep your hands as close to the format as possible, or the, the front of the chisel as possible, and you just want to lightly sand. That's all you're doing is just, just gently letting that rub across the surface of the sandpaper. And as you can see, that's already gotten quite a bit of it. Camera to focus on that. It's already gotten quite a bit of it. So let's hit that a little more so that we're more prepared when we go to the angle part of the blade. So what grit would you say this is? Uh, I believe this is the 120. I started with the 320 earlier and realized that it just needed a little bit heavier. And you can see that is um, starting to clean up nicely. And so all I got is just a little bit more right there. And you can see here where the chisel is, uh, where the uh, abrasive is hitting. It just needs to be a little bit more. You want that nice and consistent. That's how you know that it's flat. Chris, can you talk about why you really want to clean off the surface, um, making sure there's no residue underneath the new paper you're going to put on and anything like that? Uh, yeah, so one of the key things is, is it is important that if you don't clean that plate off, all of that residue, all of that glue, anything that's under there becomes like a speed bump. And so that's the whole reason why you're going with a flat surface and, and not putting this on, you know, wood or, or some other substrate. Because if it's not flat, you're, you're much less likely to get a true flat surface on your tool. And so this is getting a little closer. You can see there's just a little more left. We hit this just a little more. And then we'll flip this over and do the 120. The key is you want to make sure that you do this entire chisel. And I was hoping to kind of have this done in stages, but we talked about it and we thought, you know what, this is live. Let people see what happens live and go from there. So I may not get this perfect, but I'm gonna get it really close. So now let's switch this over and I'm gonna try to get this as close to centered as possible. Let me back this up just a little bit so you can see all three grits. I'm gonna go ahead and lock this in place so it doesn't move on me. Now I'm going to work my way from here. So Chris, I have a question. Um, is there any rhyme or reason to doing swirls and circles or linear with the blade? It, it One, it's easier on the back, especially it, to help maintain that contact. If, if you did, now I could do this but the problem is the minute you start doing something like this, you've changed your, your action and it's likely that you could make this thing rock. And uh, if you don't keep it flat and this just, this works well. Um, most of the industry standard, if you will, is to just kind of keep that action. The whole key is if you can make these swirls and not dig these corners into the abrasive on this motion, or if, you don't rock it backwards on this motion. You can use whatever method you choose, but this is a very consistent, easy method to learn if you're getting into it and it's effective. So that's the reason I use it. Yeah, see, we're getting a little close. You can see the back is starting to be a little more polished. Now, if this was in real life, I would work a lot harder at getting this even, but being that this is alive, what I'm trying to do is get us to a stage so that you guys don't fall asleep while I'm sharpening chisels. 
to where you can kind of see the process. So this would be the one um, the 120 here. This is the um, 600 and then 1200. Oh, sorry, 320. Now, is there any pressure difference between the aluminum oxide and the silicon carbide? Do what? Any pressure difference between the two different grip materials? Yeah, we talked about that earlier about the the silicon carbide being a sharper grain, and you can see that's really starting to polish up now, except for here where it's a little low. But I think I had a little burr I was working on. So if we were to continue this on and hit this with the 1200, you know, slightly out of frame, I'll try to stay back. And I'm not putting a lot of pressure, especially on the silicon carbide. I'm putting just enough pressure to maintain contact with the sandpaper. Now, here's the beauty on the silicon carbide. If we wanted to, we could switch to a lubricant, which would actually work better on this and achieve a better end result. So you can start to see where you, you, you can see reflection in there now. So you can see yourself, except for on the end. If I did a better job on the end, it, it really would look better. So now that we once you get the back flat, then it's time to set up your jig. All right. Now, how the jigs work. Now, I'm going to be using this uh, Veritas and how this particular one works. I know this chisel is a one inch chisel. This has this little jig that mounts to the front. And I'm going to line this notch up right here. If you can see if you can, can get it where you can see it. There's a little notch right here on this plate. I'm going to line that up with this measuring um, place on the front to where that is locked up with one. Because that is one inch. Now how this works is there's a little dovetail right here. And there's a matching dovetail on the plate. And once this locks into place, you're set. Now I've already got my 25 degree set under my standard angle. I have my jig set at standard. Now, what we're gonna do is flip it over. And here's the benefit of aligning your width of your chisel up with what the reference mark is on the jig. When you flip this over, let's see if I can get an angle of that. We're going to insert your tool through that. And Loosen that up a little. A little more. There, it's got a little fence right here. This little lip that your tool is going to rest against. So you're going to slide that in until it just barely makes contact with that little stop point. Okay. Now you don't want to jam it in there or you damage the tip of your tool. Get it locked in there just a little bit and you want to slowly rotate these tensioning screws evenly. You want to make sure that that is resting flat on your tool. If it's not resting flat on your tool, if it's in there crooked, it's going to screw you up and create problems for you. So one, you want to make sure that this is flat, which it is. This is flat, which it is. You're going to get it snug. This is tight, tight against the fence. Snug, snug. Now you can flip this back over and maybe... There we go. Remove that jig. Now your chisel is mounted in your jig appropriately. Now I've already kind of been working on this a little bit just so that I could get the 25 degree. This is a brand new chisel. Uh, it literally has never been sharpened. Uh, but what I've did was I want to make sure that I matched it to my 25 degree. And you can see the lower half here has been mated to this 25 degree on the jig. I don't need this entire surface to match. The main cutting area of your tool is way down here. So I wanted to come up about halfway and I used the uh, 80 grit to be able to achieve that since I had to completely reshape it. And it was worth the time because I'm going to be using this jig every time I sharpen this chisel. And so now I've got this shaped to 25 degrees based on this setting. All right. Now here's the reason why I like having the spacing between my jig. When I flip this over now, I've got all this empty space to now operate my jig to be able to sharpen this. Now, if you decide, you know what, I, I, you could be off because of, you know, you're lower than your paper. Well, then take a piece of your material, lay it down, and you can use that as a gauge uh, to keep your level so you're on the same plane as you were before. 
I it doesn't bother me. This is especially when you're using these two finer grits, it's not going to be that much. So now the key behind this, and I'm going to hit this a little bit with that. Actually, let me go to this one is making sure that you maintain contact here and that you're not rocking your tool, which is the reason why I, this is this is such a benefit to have this wider brass wheel compared to this. Okay. So now all you want to do is let this ride on your work or on your plate. Let your tool press against there. And this can be done one-handed. Uh, just put your fingers on the tool and all you're going to do is glide it. Just like that. And you can see here that this side here is getting making contact and sharpening. So if we look that over, we can see real quick, this side's what's getting hit. Let me put my, my plate back on. I want to just make sure that I do have that set properly so that I'm not creating problems for myself. That's the downside with being doing this live is. And I think I do. Let me uh, take this chisel back out. Well, if you want to, I'll go ahead and um, mention that the Veritas Mark II honing guide set, which Chris is using and is definitely a fan of it'll accommodate chisels as narrow as half inch and up to two and seven eighths wide so you can get your plane irons in there and up to 15 30 seconds thick so that gives you a lot of versatility you get three angle bevels sorry uh, you get three bevel angle configurations 25 degree to 54 degrees and in seven increments then of course 15 to 40 degrees and in six increments and then the third range is for your back bevels uh, the blade stop has discrete positions for preset angles and the um, the roller being a wide two inch wide will give you exact accurate measurements and rolling every time that you do it. The other difference that we have is the standard honing guide from Veritas, which is a slightly smaller roller. I think it's an inch and a half, uh, but it will hold blades up to two and three eighths inch wide and five eighths of an inch thick. This one does not come with that angle guide that Chris was showing earlier. Also, Mike, the one Chris is using, also we sell attachments that way you can do uh, mortising chisels and, and, and stuff like that. Yes, there's other attachments that come for the Veritas guide, absolutely. Okay, so I did have this set in here just, just slightly crooked, <clears throat> so I'm glad I went back and checked that. And as you can see, let's uh, get this started so you can I'll come to a clean area. And you'll note that the entire chisel now is making a mark on the sandpaper and again this is this is a silicon carbide so a really it's better suited if i were to use some kind of lubricant like water or even the lapping fluid works um oil also works i mean you remember you're dealing with metal here you could put you could put machine oil right there and actually use that on this material and all you want to do is just once you get it shaped all you're after is just a light pass. So I'm just making very light passes. And you can see now that it's starting to generate, if I can find the angle, starting to generate a nice little there edge there. Okay. So it does take time. This isn't something that's going to happen over, you know, over, you know, just a few minutes, a couple of minutes, especially with a new chisel, because you're trying to find and create that angle from scratch. So I'm going to run it across here just a little bit more. A few more strokes. It is uh, definitely not something that's uh, fun to watch, I'm sure. But there you go. Now we'd be ready to go hit the next grid. And all I'm doing is just maintaining contact, very little pressure. <clears throat> I probably should have brought some water back here, put on here. And as you can see there, that's a nice clean edge all the way up. And that looks really good. So at this point, if 
you were happy with the result. And you wanted to use the leather strop on here to hone that up. Now this happens to have some trend polishing paste. So I'm going to maintain that and continue to put a little bit of that on there. And again, you could put a coarser compound on the coarser side, should you choose to. Now with this, you're going to just do the same thing. It's just more of the same. I'm going to kind of rub that in a little bit more. Find me a paper towel. Doesn't take much at this stage. Once you get to the honing side, you're, you're about there. And there you go. You're uh, ready to go carve some stuff. Now also what you want to do is while you're here is, let's see, I'm going to have to move this out to the edge, is you want to just lightly knock that burr off the back. And let's take it out of the jig and see what we've got. <clears throat> so the paste that Chris was using is the Trend White Honing Paste, and it is a 8,000 to 10,000 grit or 2 to 3 micron in size. So this thing is very sharp. Um, I'm not going to shave with it, nor am I going to cut paper. There's no sense in trying to do all that. Uh, but this is a good process that literally lets you go from one step to the other and using sandpaper achieve a very nice result. And if you're using a jig like this, what this lets you do is have repeat angles and most of your hand chisels are gonna be around 25 degrees. If you're looking for plain irons, they're gonna be same. Uh, this particular jig will do everything from a half inch all the way up to two and a half inch, two and five eighths inch wide plain iron. Um, if you need to go smaller, they do make a small jig uh, for this that allows you to use the same setup but use the setup for smaller, narrower chisels, quarter inch up to half inch. So sandpaper sharpening is a lot of, lot of stuff available for it. It's very easy to do. I mean, you saw we essentially went through this pretty quickly, and that was with me blabbering. Had I taken some more time to really do this right, it would have been a couple of more minutes on certain grits, going through the range, and either way, we're walking away here with a very sharp chisel. Thank you so much. So the full kit, which is 16 pieces, including the phenolic backing, is LC50001. And the sandpaper only is SS99912. The backer plate only is LC50000. That is six inches by 18 inches long, double-sided and three quarters of an inch thick. Uh, if you'd like rolls or sheets, we have them available in aluminum oxide, six inches by 12 inch sheets, 80 grit to 320 with the PSA on the back. And then we have the six inch by five meter rolls, 80 to 320 with the PSA on the back. Silicon carbide, if you want to do that fine polishing, we have the individual sheets, which is 320 to 2000. And then we have the six by five meter rolls, 240 to 2000. And those are all uh, sticky on the back. The Veritas guide, the basic one, is going to be the VT05020. The Deluxe uh, Mark II honing guide set is VT05091. The economic honing guide is B as in boy H19117. And the brass angle checker, BH19585. And then the trend lapping fluid, which is something you can use as a um, as a lubricant for your silicon carbide sharpening, is TD20015. And then, of course, the uh, trend white honing paste is TD266. And all of these products can be found at woodworkingshop.com. Yeah, so hopefully you found this informative. Uh, maybe it gave you some inspiration to get out and keep your tools sharp. Uh, maybe you got a buddy who's got a machine and you keep taking your stuff to him. Well, you know what? This saves you the gas money from having to take it over there. Now you can do it yourself at the convenience of your own shop or in your own home or whatever you please and uh, keep your stuff sharp, sharp with sandpaper. That's right. And then if it's been five years since the last time you sharpened, you now know how to remove the sandpaper. Yeah, yeah. So I'll work on the other side later off camera and um, 
maybe I won't let this one go quite five years before I remove it. That sounds like a good deal. Yeah, some of us haven't sharpened in a while. That's how it works. So uh, we well, thank you so you know, much. We are setting up a shop in this uh, video room. So we're looking to set up a small shop. So we're going to have hand tools. And because we're going to have hand tools, we've got to have a way of sharpen them. That's you right. Know, we've got access to Tormek and Wolverine, the stuff that, you know, Turn Master Chris has been working on on Thursdays. But sometimes it uh, just takes a little bit of handwork to get it just right. So many opportunities. So uh, just to let you know that if you get onto the Saw Stop sale before May 3rd, you can get the price, you can beat the price increase. So save now on the world's safest table saw before May 3rd. If you order now, you can go to woodworkingshop.com slash shop by brand slash Saw Stop or just search Saw Stop in the search box. Be like me, beat the price increase. That's right. <laughs> So thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. if you would check out woodworkingshop.com. You can also check us out at 800-228-0000. If you have questions on this video, you can ask for Chris or Mike or Chris. Um, we thank you again for watching. I'm Bryce, I'm proud of it live. I'm Mike Z. I'm Chris. See you next time. Everybody have a great day. Thank you so much.